Well, let us prepare ourselves for worship as we light our Christ candle. Epiphany is the season of light. Epiphany meaning revealing, as in revealing of Christ to the world. It's also the time of year when the days get longer. Isn't it nice? Five o'clock, it's not pitch dark right now. <laughs> Sun gets brighter. But mainly, for our purpose, God's light shines into the darkest corners. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And so we light a candle to remind us of Jesus, God's light, which is a lamp before each and every one of us showing us the way. Let us join in our choral intro, Behold, Behold.
center ourselves in our worship time with an opening prayer. Let us pray. Gentle and disturbing God, you called us to this place, called us to be a community of faith. You issue individual calls to each of us in our lives. And as we gather in our times of struggles, you hold us together. As we gather in our times of celebrating, you are our joy. In our times of serving, may we do so abundantly. We gather this our prayer as we worship you in spirit and truth this day, making our prayer in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So if you haven't gathered already, today's about call. Watched a very interesting movie last night, afternoon, before the hockey and football game. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a priority, see? <laughs> and it was called The Healer. Well, the healer was actually a guy who healed people's electronic stuff. <laughs> but he goes to this village. He's, he meets up with the, an uncle he never knew, and the uncle sends him. He's, he's going to pay off all his debts, and he's going to send him to Nova Scotia, to Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. And it turns out that he is an actual healer. It's worth watching. Look it up. Yeah, it's called The Healer. Great movie. But he, it was so biblically centered for me, as a you know, theologian is always looking at the biblical part of things, because he resisted the call, he resisted the call to be the healer, and actually turned them down. Yeah, it's worth watching. I won't say any more about it. <laughs> it's called the healer. I don't know what I was on. But I just used the thing and talked to Alexa, you know. <laughs> So anyhow, today's, the, the, the first lesson is a Hebrew scripture lesson from 1 Samuel, and it's the call of the prophet Samuel as a young boy. And Samuel was dedicated by his mother Hannah to the temple at Shiloh, served under the priest Eli, as a, starting out as a young boy, in a time where not many had visions or heard the voice of God. So if you've never heard the voice of God, don't fret. Even back in biblical times, there was long periods where nobody got any calls or visions. Nonetheless, the boy Samuel, lying in the temple near the Ark of the Covenant, heard the voice of God in the middle of the night. Twice he woke up. He woke up Eli, thinking Eli had called him. And Eli, each time, would send him back to bed. When Samuel did it a third time, Eli recognized that it was God that was calling Samuel. And he instructed him how to respond to God. Then we get further on in, in the op optional verses for today. And God tells Samuel what he's about to do. And it isn't good news for Eli and especially for his sons who have turned away from God. Samuel was afraid to tell Eli what God had told him, but Eli encourages him to tell it all, and he did, and Eli accepted it. And from then on, Samuel spoke on behalf of God, and became known as a trustworthy prophet of God. So let us listen to the Hebrew scripture reading from 1 Samuel 3, 1 to 20. I don't know why they shortened it up, 11 to 20, it makes it a lot longer. <laughs> Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of, the, of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am. He 
ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told you, told him, that I am about to punish his house forever, for the inequity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the inequity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning, and he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it he told you? He said, Do not hide it from me. May God be, do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The second reading from the Gospel of John, a Gospel lesson that focuses on the call of the first disciples. Jesus called Philip of Bethsaida, the same town that Andrew and Peter were from, and Philip responded by following Jesus. He went and told his friend Nathaniel that they had found the one Moses and the prophets wrote about. However, Nathaniel was skeptical that anything good could come from Nazareth. When Nathanael showed up, Jesus said out loud that this was an Israelite who was upfront and true and told Nathanael that he saw him sitting under the fig tree before Philip called him. Nathanael believed and proclaimed that Jesus was the Son of God, the King of Israel. Jesus asked if he believed because of what Jesus told him, and then he said he would see greater visions so let us listen for the good news of John 1, 43 to 51. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? 
you will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. In this reading is good news for God's people. May the Spirit of the living God be with us today. Amen. What do you see? Loving, gracious God, may what is said and heard be in the spirit of you, our living God. Amen. So many stories that have come from Fred Craddock over the years. For the, oh, I always like to career him as the, the granddaddy of preaching in the United States. Died a few years ago now, I think book maybe four or five years ago, 85, 87 years old. And he was a, I don't know if he was Baptist, I guess he was Baptist, Southern Baptist, but voted one of the most <laughs> beloved preachers of the United States in his younger days. In fact, if you want to actually watch him and hear him, there's a YouTube video where he's doing a sermon. I guess he was a guest minister somewhere. And he's doing a sermon. The sermon's entitled, Jesus Saves. And it's worth watching. It's just amazing. I'll, I'll send out the link to it if you're interested. I'll e email the link to it. He's uh, just absolutely amazing. And, and I don't think he uses any notes. <laughs> it just comes out of it. <laughs> so anyhow, he tells, tells a story about being at a, at a rollicking night at the theater. <laughs> a young actor named Tom Key was playing the part of Jesus in a play called the Cotton Patch Gospel. And he was clearly bringing the house down. The play was a romping bluegrass musical which depicts the ministry of Jesus as if it had occurred in the cotton fields and Baptist churches of rural South Georgia. And it was in its final performance run when Key was feeling confident and even inventive with his lines. His spontaneous enthusiasm was contagious, and he had forged between himself and the audience a rare bond of mutual exchange and appreciation. During the scene depicting the Sermon on the Mount, he, as Jesus, suddenly turned from the, from the group on the stage toward the audience, pointed to the blank auditorium wall, and said, look at the lilies in the field. And he stopped, almost as if he had forgotten his next line. And he peered around at the disciples, focused again on the audience, and repeated, look at the lilies in the field. Once more he stopped, and seemed to be searching for his next words. The audience began to kind of shift uncomfortably. His hand extended yet again to the blank wall. And this time he spoke the words slowly, and deliberately, look at the lilies in the field. And then he turned to his disciples, shrugging his shoulders, and he said, I can't get them to look. <laughs> the Holy Spirit just came in. <laughs> the room filled with laughter. That isn't part of the story. <laughs> the door just opened up. The room filled with laughter as it dawned on the audience that he really wanted them to look. Sure enough, when he gave one more try, look at the lilies in that field, every head in the audience turned to look at the blank side wall. Craddock writes, I don't know whether old John the Evangelist was present in the theater that night, but if not, he should have been. It was his kind of show, because indeed, he spends his entire gospel trying to get people to look, to really to look at the life of Jesus. Light and darkness, vision and dimness. Once I was blind, but now I see. These are the materials of John's gospel, he writes. Chapter after chapter, John's finger points towards his Lord, and his voice sounds the refrain, look, look, look. Well, the willingness to look and to see stands at the center of this story about Nathaniel. According to John, Nathaniel is approached by Philip, who tells Nathaniel that they found the, the one that Moses and the prophets wrote about. 
and his name is Jesus of Nazareth. Well, Nathaniel is a bit <laughs> big time skeptical, crosses his arms, plays that pre recorded tape of a blind prejudiced which sees nothing but knows everything. We know certain politicians like that. <laughs> you know people that are like that too, don't you? And he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> I had a minister tell me that one day about Hastings and Rose Neath. Yeah, I was, I, I just lost it. <laughs> can anything good come out of Rose Neath and Hastings? <laughs> He figured, and he actually put words to it. He said, I thought the Hastings and Rose Neath were just all the rejects from Coburg gone north. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. Anyhow, <laughs> it is funny, but <laughs> it wasn't funny to me at the time because I just started serving the churches. And I mean, oh, they're good people. Uh, anyhow, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's <laughs> what Daniel says. Uh, so, Philip responds with three words which embrace everything the church knows that it, and all it needs to really know to say in its evangelism. Come and see. It's like children who have, see a meteor shower outside and it's lighting up the night sky and they run breathlessly into the house to get their parents to come out. And the church operates like that, or should operate like that, running towards the world pulling it gently, but urgently, saying, come and see, come and see. I just feel a pastoral letter coming up out of this. <laughs> come and see. Yeah. There are wonders beyond imagining to behold. Come and see, says John's Gospel, but the actor playing Jesus shrugged his shoulders and said, I can't get them to look. <laughs> Sometimes people do not see the grace of God at work in the world through Christ because they will not come to that place where they can see. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness is not overcome. It. But the light is not always visible from every vantage point. You have to come out and see. You have to come and see. You have to look at it from different vantage points. And we're not just we're not talking physical sight here. It's that mind's eye. In a lot of cities, people are homeless, sleeping in the streets, freezing to death in the deep cold. So a church decided to open its gymnasium as an overnight shelter. Many people from the church who helped out made comments of how they felt their faith in action as they took part in helping. And their reliance on the grace of God through Christ reinforced by their experience. After the shelter was open, one of the pastors of the church was interviewed by the radio. The interviewer was a, an opinionated fundamentalist whose biases were quite strong. It became clear during the interview that he felt the church ought to stick to the business of preaching the old time gospel, and stay away from meddlesome activities like shelters for homeless people. At one point he jeered, now, now just tell me, where is Jesus in all this? You notice how I said that. <laughs> Where's Jesus? For a moment, the pastor considered how to respond. And he said calmly, come and see. You just have to be there. And if you are there, then you will be able to see where Jesus is in all this. Come and see, said Philip to Nathaniel. And some people do not see because they will not come to those places where they can get that right angle of vision where one can see the grace of Christ at work in the world. Come and see, says John's Gospel, but the Jesus of the Cotton Patch Gospel shrugged his shoulders and said, I can't get them to look. There are other times when people do not see the grace at work in the world through Christ because even when they come to that place where Christ is at work, they will not look, like really look, <laughs> look deep. Some peer at everything but see nothing. In some ways, this is all that can be said to us, all that needs to be said to us. Come and see. Nathaniel went, Nathaniel saw. 
Jesus gave him new eyes, and with them he saw the true light. He said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. To which Jesus replied, in effect, keep looking, Nathaniel. There's even more to see. There will be more to see. If we do come with a willingness to see, then like Nathaniel, we will find a Christ who will open our blind, blinded eyes, clear the dimness of our vision, and show us more wonders of grace than we ever dreamed were there to see. In her book, Becoming Human, Letty Russell describes the new sense of vision which was given to her, ironically, when she lost one of her eyes in a freak accident. Things which had once loomed large for her now became small in light of the more important realities of sight and health and the compassionate care for others. Moreover, her personal pain heightened her sensitivity to the pain of others and deepened her awareness of her own need for God's care. In other words, even though she had lost an eye, she could see more. She writes this, This discovery that I was becoming at one and the same time both stronger and weaker was a small sign that God was patiently helping me to become more human. That can happen to us when we're given a new view on a certain problem with a whole new perspective. Sometimes we gain new sight and can see something not as a problem, but as an opportunity to help a fellow human being. Years ago, it wasn't that long ago, there was a TV program called Bull. Did you ever watch it? I, used to, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Jason Bull. Dr. Jason Bull, he's a trial analyst in this show. And he has this team of experts, he's rich too, rich beyond compare, and he, he charges atrociously for his work. But he has this team of experts who work with him to analyze people and pick the right personalities for a jury to help the defense win a case. It's a very interesting show. And often in the show, even though the evidence is truly not in favor of the defendant, Bolt is able to convince a jury to side with him because he puts the case into a totally different perspective. He does that by getting them to see with new eyes. Like the man who wouldn't support a church initiative to build a new clinic for refugees and their health care until he saw the support that was there, which came mainly through a little boy, a wee boy who climbed up onto his lap and gave the churchman a big hug and said thank you to him. Just like Nathaniel, he was seeing with unblinded vision. What does it take to help us see better? What do the lilies of the field look like through, uh, through our eyes? What do we see when we look at Jesus, when we look as Jesus would have us look? Come and see, Philip said to Nathaniel. And what did he see? Well, when encouraged by Jesus, you just have to be there. Come and see. Through Jesus the Christ, who knew us and loved us before we were, who loves us now and will love us forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us join together and sing, Will You Come and Follow Me? from Voices United, number 567.
life rests on gratitude and trust in God's abundance. As we give, we acknowledge that we have communally received more than enough to meet our collective needs. Our offerings serve to realize the reign of God's kingdom here on earth. We give you thanks for your ongoing support of our churches and for those who support our mission and service fund of the United Church of Canada. And Bonnie sent out an email. Last year's was over $9,000. I think about six, between the two churches, I think we were $60 short of 10000 Oh, wonderful. It's one of the nicest responses we've had in a few years, I think. So for, for January, four staff members were asked to choose a mission and service story from 2023 that is meaningful to them and to tell the audience a bit about why it was significant to them. So today's entitled Making a Home for Refugees. The story Making a Home for Refugees, Chris Ann Alvarez's work is accompanied by a video in which Chris Ann talks about how people don't necessarily want to come to Canada they're forced to leave their home and seek safety elsewhere. In light of the siege on Gaza, I have been thinking about how terrifying it is for families with nowhere to go. Palestinians have been displaced and occupied for decades, and many have ended up in Canada. This presence of new Canadians may be great for our country, but doesn't solve the underlying issues of the occupation. I can't imagine, she says, the internal struggle for those in Gaza and the West Bank. If an opportunity opens, do you go and leave everything, feeling that your departure is disloyal? Or do you stay in this incredibly unsafe space where missiles don't discriminate and a peaceful future seems impossible? At the end of the video, Chrisanne chokes up as she says, I want to see a world where everyone has a place they can call home. I think we take that very much for granted here. That is all I want too. Whether that home is the place where they were born or a country far away, I want everyone to have a land to connect with and feel safe in. That from Vicki Nelson, Community of Faith Stewardship Support Worker. We give thanks to God for that different way of looking at our mission and service stories, reflection on the previous story. I'll have another one next week. Let us join together and sing, Grant us God the grace of giving. to be called to be generous, 
to be in ministry in your world. Bless our gifts, our giving, and our hopes for a world in which your will is done. Amen. Any items of caring and sharing on this day? Rupert's all pretty shared. One. <clears throat> Did I announce earlier about the Martin Luther King thing? I think I did. Just can't remember if I did. <laughs> Martin Luther King Day tomorrow in the United States. One of the first primaries happening this week, too, in Iowa. <laughs> Anything good come out of Iowa? <laughs> lots, lots of corn. Very cold this time of year. I don't know if anybody was watching a football game last night, but boy, oh boy, could you see their breath in Kansas City. <laughs> I forget what it was, minus 17 Fahrenheit or something. Really cold. Let us all unite in prayer. Let us pray. God of new beginnings, we gather in your name on this early Sunday of the new year. As we make our way into the new year, we are filled with a sense of hope and joy. Help us to continue to feel that way, God, as we make our way through the year, not to be jaded by the ways of the world, but to trust in your love as you continue to make all things new, which includes our hearts and minds and souls and our very hopes for the future. Restore in each of us the joy of your salvation and place a new and right spirit within us all. May we focus on you, knowing that you will never leave us nor forsake us, and that we are part of each other as the body of Christ gathered together in fellowship and in worshipful praise of you. So we pray this day, God, for those who are ill of mind, body, or spirit, those who are in care facility, those who may be at the even tide of life, <coughs> those who are mourning the loss of life within their midst, May your healing touch rest upon each and every one of them. We pray this day for the areas of conflict in our world, ongoing conflicts and those that are just starting to rear ugly heads. May the wisdom of our leaders in this world Think deeply about what's going on and care more for people than they do for bombs and bullets. We hold all people who may be suffering in some way in our prayers, hoping for resolutions to conflicts. We pray this day also for natural disasters Praying for those who may be caught in floods and storms. That a measure of grace and healing may be upon them as they're devastated in their communities and various places. We pray this day, God, that in this world that seems so disharmonic, that you tune our hearts to you. Tune us into this time of discord. Help each of us to find that melody that you sing. And help us to find our ways to harmonize and bring beauty and peace to this world. 
We do not all have to sing the same note, but help us, God, to find your rhythm and make music that brings joy to this world. We offer these our prayers this day, in and through our Lord and Savior, the one who taught us to pray as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And let us join together in our closing hymn, as with gladness men of old, Voices United, number 81. in this world, may we live our lives so that the light and love of Christ is our proclamation in all that we do. And may the love of God, Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit go with each and every one of you this day, now, and forevermore. Amen. Amen.